so as you all have met Bartley already, Bartley is a senior application engineer from Agilent, and he's, he specializes in vacuum products for their entire uh, product line, and his uh, degree is in metallurgy. Metallurgy. Me metallurgy. <laughs> <laughs> metallurgy, vacuum, electronics, and project management. And obviously he's going to be talking about helium leak detection today. So thank you, Bartley. Sure. Enjoy your talk. So, like Ian said, I've got a good 30 years of field expertise with vacuum, vacuum division type of stuff. We're here today to actually talk about a little bit of vacuum, because if, if you don't understand vacuum, you're not going to understand the leak detector, how a leak detector works, or how we're going to be able to find leaks. So that will help you understand how a helium leak detector actual application is integrated into the field and uh, what we're doing. So. With that said, I will jump right into the theory because I've only got one hour and I got like 10,000 slides. All right, not that many. So I cut a bunch of them out today as I was going through as far as what would be pertinent or not. We're looking at this right here. This is, you know, as a field service guy, you know, if you put a space, spaceship or a satellite into space and something breaks down, who are you going to send up to fix it? You know, that's an expensive field service type of cost, right? So the only way you're going to be able to mimic space here on Earth is to create a huge vacuum chamber, create a vacuum like it is up in space, validate all the electronics, all the components, and everything necessary so we can do any type of repairs or anything that's not working. And as you will see, you've got this huge cement wall right here, right? And we have an internal wall. They create vacuum not only in here, but also all the way around the outside because at 14.7 PSI per square inch of vacuum, this whole thing would just collapse. So what we do, we call differentially pump. We create a vacuum here and a vacuum on the inside, so that way the complete contain, uh, container will not collapse itself. Leak detectors, well this is our newest leak detector that's out on the market. If you guys take a walk through the kind of distributing hall, we've got one of these that are actually showing you do some hands on here, we can actually show you how it operates. If we had one here, I could hook it up on the big screen and show you exactly how to leak check a component, uh, a product, a, a physical pipeline, whatever the containment is for the system with helium. So, what are we here today to talk about? What is vacuum? Why is vacuum needed? Some applications, levels of vacuum, types of pumps. We'll talk about the spectrometer tube. When I talk about the spectrometer tube, that's the heart. That's what makes the leak detector actually operate, work, and we to determine how big a leak is or not. Then you're going, oh, what's a leak rate? How big is a leak? Well, if you had hair, uh, hair is about an e to the minus five leak rate. I can do a million times smaller than one blade of hair, all right? As far as what that flow rate is and size of a leak is into a particular component, depending on your application. Then we can get into actual leak detection and what that's going to look like. So when we speak of vacuum, vacuum is a pressure or in gas that's less than one atmosphere. One atmosphere, hey, we're in San Diego, we're next to the coast, sea level, all right. That's considered atmospheric pressure at one atmosphere. We go up into space, go a little bit higher and higher, we start removing those molecules. There's not as many molecules the further and further into space we get and create a vacuum. And when we talk about pressure, pressure is all the molecules in this room hitting walls in a certain area. That certain given area we call a square inch, PSI, pounds per square inch. We're all used to filling up our tire tubes. It's how much pressure is being pushed against a square inch of surface area. Then we sit there and go, well, why is vacuum needed? All right? You guys are going, all right, yeah, vacuum, I want a leak detection, what's this class all about? Well, the reality is for somebody in the water department, like right here, who needs to evaluate the quality of their water, the chromium, the different types of chemistries, the metals, and everything else in there, they need to vaporize that water, they need to ionize that water, they need to accelerate that water or all the molecules in the water. And what are those peaks looking like? How many of you guys watch NCIS? The cute little girl Abby downstairs in the lab, you guys all know who I'm talking about, she's got all that equipment. Well, guess what? Agile makes most of that equipment. All that has to be under vacuum so we can get those different peaks and that type of resolution that we're looking for. So the better the vacuum, the better the resolution. The only way I can ensure the vacuum is to leak check that particular system so I can ensure the um, uh, resolution that I'm looking for. High energy physics. 
Uh, we were dealing with uh, uh, General Atomics on the far side. We got accelerators, we got Stanford, we got all these other high energy physics types of uh, applications and energies that are going on where they need to accelerate an atom from this wall to this wall without hitting another atom or molecule from there all the way to there. How do you do that? You lower and lower and lower and lower the vacuum to such a level where I can get miles upon miles upon miles of being able to shoot one atom to another atom. And there's also, anybody know, anybody who's had cancer? All of us, right? We all know somebody who's had cancer. We all know somebody who's probably gone under radiation therapy. When they say radiation therapy, you're accelerating an atom from one side to another, exploding the atom and colonizing the gamma rays, so that way you can bombard the tumor appropriately. The only way I can ensure that that atom can get from there to there is, guess what, with the leak detector. How big is my leak? Where is my leak found? Is it somewhere in my pipeline? What's going on? How much water? How much product am I losing? How much warranty am I losing on a particular system? Semiconductor, we all have an iPhone in your pocket or something similar. And you know, we look at those integrated circuit chips, we're down to an angstrom level of signal from one spot to another. The only way I can get an angstrom level of deposition is remove all the stuff we're breathing. All the stuff we're breathing right now is contaminant. Let's remove it out, suck it away, reintroduce chemistry and get 100% deposition on the angstrom level we want so all your semiconductor processing works. So that's semiconductor. And this right here is the main chamber. There's a robot underneath that shifts the 300 millimeter wafer to each tool through here. So there's like four more or five more tools. It takes up almost about half this room, one of these pieces of the equipment. Down, how many of you are from San Diego region? We look at, or actually anywhere for that fact, you look at any of these high rises and they have UV built into the windows or the glazing or reflectance. Even your automotive glass has got some uh, UV protecting going on in that top little string. They take that glass, they feed it through, guess what? A super large vacuum chamber. This pumps here, 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 all the way down. Big sheets of glass the size of this room, they drop it down, they send it through, they do anode and cathode, they have a target, they do deposition as far as the UV protectant or the reflective coating or anything else on these huge sheets of glass. It goes to the far side of the entire manufacturing facility, they chop it up, ship it out to whichever customer particularly wants it, and there you go. So, and all, how many of you got flat screen TVs now? We're not dealing with these big picture chains, you all got flat screen TVs now, right? Well, that's kind of a cross between glass coating and semiconductor, all right? It's kind of a cross between these two. And one of those units is about the size of this room. So you look at those 70-inch TVs nowadays that are going on, 100-inch TVs that are flat screen that some of you guys are gaming on. I know you are. And, uh, you know, the size of those chambers are pretty, uh, you know, somebody's laughing at me. Well, yeah, I got one of those. So, yeah, and don't mind me. I've had way too much coffee today. So if I talk a little fast, please forgive me. You all speak English well. Yes? All right. And, and I say, and I, and I don't mean to be facetious that way, it's just, um, uh, I was dealing with international guests this last week, and I couldn't drink as much coffee for obvious reasons, they didn't understand me. Uh, automotive applications, you know, when I travel into T1, we got a T1 automotive engineer in the room right now, and you know, we're dealing with anything from transmissions to gas tanks, you want to make sure your gas tanks aren't leaking to your radiator. There's Huge area uh, down in Juarez that I was at that makes all of Ford and Nissan's air conditioning, piping, and hoses each have to be leak checked. All right, otherwise you'll be losing the Freon, and you guys are dealing with SF6 or something like that, right? Is it, yeah, that's an air conditioning gas, is it not? Insulating. Insulating? Okay. And uh, you know, so there's all kinds of components that are necessary that have to be leak checked under systems. Power plants, if you have a large pipeline leak, you're losing energy or you're losing water and material. Uh, so you need to validate large systems. So a leak detector can actually be placed in line into the jet stream here. We can spray helium somewhere down here. The helium will come through the jet stream and be picked up. And we can figure out where the leak is at in a weldment, a casting, a component, a sealing spot, and whether the component is this small or whether the component is as large as this room. We're able to determine exactly what's going on. We got a huge vacuum furnace right here, and you can tell that this thing's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or ten huge vacuum pumps just to evacuate this vessel to a low enough level. Now, when I talk about rough vacuum, that's all these big old pumps right here. 
And then we're going to talk about the high vacuum and molecular flow and molecules that can't find their way to the door. And how do we capture those and pump those away so we can get to a lower level? All right? So, you know, I've got a pacemaker, heart issues years ago. The, you know, the last thing I want to do is put, a, put in a leaky pacemaker into my heart. It gets contaminated and i got to do stuff with it. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Colloquial hearing devices out of Southern California here. Radiation devices whenever you get an x-ray machine. If you're building any type of pharmaceutical medicines or anything like that. Or you guys like brewing beer or whiskey or anything good like that? Drinking it. Drinking it, fantastic. Now that California is legal with the cannabis industry, I do at least about a million dollars worth of business in the cannabis industry for processing the wax and the uh, materials for edibles and stuff like that. So yeah, I got a cool job, trust me. <laughs> um, but all that stuff is done in a manufacturing facility. All these pipelines need to be leak checked, whether it's piping or whatever the case is, to ensure oxygen is not getting in and we're not contaminating the system or we have a loss of material, all right? So all that stuff needs to be done. We talked about semiconductor, we talked about linear accelerators, gas panels. These are the groups that are actually injecting gas and you don't want to lose gas. So sometimes you positively charge the system with helium and then we sniff around it to see if any helium is leaking out of our containment system. If it is leaking out, we can determine where it's leaking out because the reality is if you don't and you're running nasty gases like you are in the semiconductor industry, your gas alarm is going to go off you're going to be evacuated out of the manufacturing lab uh, and whatever's going on. And quite honestly, that stuff will kill you in uh, just a quick little breath. You know, cyanide and a few of the other ones smell like garlic and you're already done. It's too late at that point in time. So you got gas pumps for all that. Uh, semiconductor, again, we can get past that. This is a scanning electron microscope. So for anybody who is on the high energy physics and you, you know, sometimes you see those pictures of like a bug's eye and it gets like super, super deep. It goes way, way deep into it. Well, that's what a scanning electron microscope is. You put your sample in on the inside, and they create an electron beam that comes down, and you want to sample it. The only way we can do that is e to the minus 10 and 11 pressure. So if we're popped positive 760, right now we'll call it positive 1,000. Now let's go minus 11 negative in pressure. So let's move that zero. 11 space, or that decimal place in 11 places, and now let's get to the vacuum level that's necessary to operate a scanning electron microscope. Right? The only way you can ensure that's going to have that type of integrity is with the helium leak detector and being able to leak check. All right, so we got customers worldwide, multi billion dollar industry between vacuum and leak detection. There's nothing you have from semiconductor, from a computer to your iPhone to your water quality, anything else you have in this entire world to the thread count on my shirt without using vacuum. Multiple customers across the board, you know, you got industry, lots of uh, 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 automotive over on this side, heavy industry, energy and utilities, medical and pharmaceutical. Now we get into the physics. All right, now we're back to school, kids. Boom. I kind of explained what it is we're doing. I'm moving quick because I only got 45 minutes. I want to move an atom from here, boom, over to this side right here. Well, there's a couple of different layers of vacuum. I can only get this far if there's no vacuum created. If I create semi-good vacuum, eh, I might get a little bit. If I create a really good vacuum, I can actually go from there to here or miles further than that. All right? So in atmosphere, generally, the number one contaminant that we all have right now is water moisture. <coughs> I've got layers and layers and layers of water moisture built up on this particular wall right now. Under vacuum, and when I lower the vapor pressure in any particular room, that water starts to get excited. It starts to boil off. It starts to desorb, is what we call it. It starts to boil off, boil off all the contaminants. And I end up with a very clean surface. And if I'm doing ancient level deposition like I am on my cell phone and with my ion or my semiconductor chips on there, I want a super clean surface. So I need to boil away or create a vacuum so I have a pure surface to work with. All right, so we all, we all can see light bulbs. All right, it's not a big deal whatsoever, but how many of us like throwing light bulbs? Because, all right, I'm, I'm gonna use it from a boy perspective because I'm a boy. I'm not gonna use it just a girl perspective. But if you threw a light bulb, it goes Doo! and it creates that vacuum or blows up, or if you had a 22 or a BB gun and you shot one of those old, uh, 
um, TV tubes, you could hear it kind of implode. And it was kind of fun stuff to do as a kid, at least in the country anyway. Um, and so I wanted to vacuum for one reason, a hot filament. A hot filament creates ions, which basically illuminates all the gases inside that vacuum chamber, all right? If I ionize or turn this on and we have atmosphere, well, guess what's 21% in our atmosphere that we're breathing besides nitrogen? Oxygen. Oxygen. So then we oxidize the filament. Once we oxidize the filament, it becomes brittle. So it has a higher tendency to break. This is a critical component because inside of a vacuum leak detector, we have two filaments. We only run one at a time. But the filament, we try to protect the best we can. We don't want to dump the system to atmosphere because there's oxygen in it. And we don't want to oxidize it because we don't want it to become brittle and break. And everything breaks on you on a three-day weekend. It's Friday night and you had plans that weekend. I've, I've been in manufacturing long enough. There's some sort of curse about a three-day weekend and you working on that Friday night and having your product out. So when we were talking about kind of rough vacuum in order to get molecules part way, rough vacuum. You can either have an oil pump or a dry scroll pump. High vacuum where it's just really where the leak detector works, where my heart, when I was talking about the heart works, is either working with the turbine pump, kind of looks like a jet engine with the jet propellers going on, or a diffusion pump, which reminds you of a coffee percolator for any of you who like to go camping. And this section over here, ultra high vacuum and ion pumps, we're not gonna talk about that today. It's, it's just not applicable to um, to the leak detector, but in the general atomics and depending on what type of engineering you're doing and the physics that you're working with, with uh, UHV levels, this may be highly, highly applicable to you and we can talk afterwards. I'm just not going to curtail the whole class towards that. Uh, two types of flows. You know, oh yeah, I'm pulling vacuum, all right? Well, viscous flow, well, Bart, what is viscous flow? All right, sir, can you open that door for me? All right, I yell fire, bam, we all go roll, running out the door. Bam, just like that. All of us are working on top of each other, right? We're all kind of pushing each other to get out the door, there's a fire going on. But guess what? There's one black guy. He can't find his way around. He's the molecule, he's at a low enough pressure where the molecules aren't acting upon each other, where the one blind guy bounces from one wall to the ceiling to another wall to the wall behind me until he finally finds the door. When he finally finds the door, we can then push him out. And then the more blind guys I push out, the lower and lower the vacuum gets. But it's real easy to go from here down to a certain level. Much more difficult to get all the blind people out of the room. This is the difference between viscous flow and molecular flow, all right? Two different pumps will work in both of those scenarios. So at atmosphere right now, lots of molecules. That's what we're breathing right now. 7.6 with positive tor, which basically means my mean free path when I want to accelerate this atom from this side to this side over here is e to the minus six of an inch, which basically is squeezing your fingers as tight as you can. I can't move an atom whatsoever at, in that type of distance. But if I create a vacuum and I get down low enough to the minus four range, I've got 20 inches now. I can actually move that molecule from there to there. 20 inches, and I have a lot more mean free path. The lower and lower I get vacuum, the better the mean free path, the better the resolution on the leak detector, as well as with Abby down in her lab trying to check all the equipment that's going on. There's no one pump that goes from atmosphere, which is 10 to positive 2 approximately, down to ultra high vacuum. Everything is in series, so there's always a lag and a crossover and multiple things. They may tell you, hey, I've got this one gauge that goes from atmosphere all the way down to here, BS. They've got two gauges put together in one cute little package, but it's two gauges that actually cross over somewhere in between and take you that entire span. Physics-wise, it doesn't allow you to do it. Uh, when we talk about rotary vein pumps, these are oil rotary vein pumps. Excuse me. Oil rotary vein pumps has an oil mechanism on the inside for pumping down. Oil reservoir, yeah, you just make sure that the oil is kept full, just like your automotive car. You don't change your car oil, guess what? You're either going to run it dry and freeze your car, like my brother did to car again, idiot, but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> or 
um, your oil gets contaminated, and when you drain it and you change your oil, it's super, super black because you didn't change your filter or anything else for years to come, and your engine's getting gummed up and geeked up. Same type, same type of thing. So we'll actually run into a mechanical pump. Let me see here. Mechanical pump on the right. Swipes around, so it's taking an atmosphere, swipes around, compresses it, pops out the gas. So the more and more we swipe around and it exit the gas, the better and better the vacuum will become on one side. The other technology, remember, that was a hydrocarbon oil-based application. If you have oil in your application, does oil contaminate my process? Maybe at uh, General Atomics, yeah, I can't use anything oil. One little micro hydrocarbon of oil is going to contaminate my whole system. Maybe in the water industry, it's going to contaminate my system. In the cannabis industry, like I was telling you about, that I also work in, could contaminate an entire batch of product. You know, so it's like, oh, well, what do we do with that? Well, there's an answer to that. It's called dry or a dry pump. And the reason why I tell you this is because if you order a leak detector, you can either get a wet oil pump or a dry pump depending on how you want to use the application. A dry pump is basically two scroll modules. Picture your cinnamon roll in the morning, all right? And one cinnamon roll rotates around, and we grab air and kind of compress it to the center. And that's kind of what it looks like. You know, we're taking in gas, we're compressing it all the way through, then we exhaust it through the center. That's kind of what it looks like right here. You can kind of see the scroll module here. Here's the receiving head. And guess what there is? Actually, a video I believe that plays either here or next. Oh, you gotta turn this thing off. Scroll pump technology has emerged as a highly effective means of producing rough or primary vacuum. Scroll technology was originally applied to the gas compressor industry. In recent years, Application to vacuum pumps has yielded tangible benefits for users of high and ultra-high vacuum, as well as many clean industrial processes. Scroll technology is not complex, but may be difficult to envision. In the simplest form, two machine scrolls are positioned facing one another, with the scroll patterns nested within each other. In order to pump, that is, to move and compress gas, one of the scrolls is fixed, while the other moves in orbital fashion. This motion, called nutation, produces pockets of captured gas that move in an intended direction. In most cases, gas is moved toward the center of the scroll pair, where it is exhausted from the pump when it reaches the center of the scroll pattern. In this arrangement, compression of the gas is achieved in the last wraps of the scroll pattern, leading to more efficient exhaust. For a scroll pump to capture and move gas effectively, a dynamic seal must be made between the tip of one scroll and the corresponding bottom of the channel in the other scroll. This tip seal is energized by compression to create a durable and effective seal between pockets. A major advantage of this mechanism is the absence of sealing or lubricating oil, eliminating the need to change pump oil, as well as removing the risk of oil contamination in the vacuum system, are both very significant benefits to operators of clean or ultra-high vacuum systems. While the tip seal is subject to wear, Replacement of tip seals is a simple, quick, and infrequent process. Depending on the application in which the vacuum pump is used, typical tip seal life can be from one to three years of practical use. The dry scroll vacuum pump is a robust and effective means of achieving rough or primary vacuum and can greatly simplify the process of achieving and maintaining high or ultra high vacuum. To learn more about dry scroll vacuum pumps, come. Uh, it's all marketed at that point. So we have a rough pump, whether it was wet or dry. It goes from atmosphere down to about 1 times 10 to the minus 3 tor in pressure, all right? But from minus 3 and below, we're dealing with that blind man. How do I deal with the blind guy who can't find his way to the door? And if he does find his way to the door, what do I do with him at that point? At that point, we hook up a turbo molecular pump, which is also inside of our system. These turbo pumps, come in several different sizes depending on how much pumping I need to do. Small amount, large amount, larger amount of, uh, of gas species that I need to work with. This turbo pump itself has a rotor. This rotor and where these tips are, are spinning, at least the one in the leak detector, at 70,000 RPM. 
All right, 70,000 RPM is running at such a fast speed that when the molecule comes down, its natural trajectory is to bounce off at a 90 degree angle. And we want to change that trajectory so that way it will bounce through the, basically, when you find your way to the door, you're getting spun, you're getting kicked a certain way, and you're being forced kind of down and out to that roughing pump, which is oil or dry. And then we exhaust you back to atmosphere from there. And the more and more molecules that hit the top of this and get pumped away, the better and better the vacuum is at the top. This is talking about the compression ratio down below. I'm not going to spend time with that. If we don't have a turbine pump to capture those molecules, way back when, prior to the development of turbo pumps and turbo pump technology, we used to have oil pumps. The oil pumps would create a jet stream. For those that are in heavy industry, there's one or two of you that are in heavier industry. Uh, the jet pumps are a diffusion pump, and basically a molecule will find its way, hit this jet stream, and then be pumped down and out and exhausted to either the oil pump or dry pump. Now, the jet stream kind of looks like a, a, a coffee percolator. We have a heat source down below. There's oil that's down below. We heat that oil until it reaches its vapor pressure. It comes up the stack, and then comes out like a beautiful little curtain all the way around. So any atom or molecule that actually hits that curtain of uh, high energy oil gets pumped down and out. The lower and lower I can pump that out, the better and better my vacuum is up above it. So now we're going to get into a leak detector. All right, you guys came here for a leak detector class. We covered the applications. We kind of covered the basic physics. Now let's talk about the leak detector itself, the heart. How does a leak detector think? How does it work? How does it operate? Well, in 1912, Dr. Thompson basically designed or uh, figured out the principle of mass spectroscopy, and he basically developed that I, I, you can ionize gases in a vacuum, you can accelerate them through a fixed voltage, you can separate ions by passing them through a magnetic field, and you can collect those ions uh, based upon an electrical current or an ion current. And if I can collect that via current, well, I can correlate that to ding, 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 a leak rate, all right? And that's basically what he did. Gas, so now, now picture it now. All that's left in this room are a couple blind people, all right? There's nobody else in the room. All of us rushed out in viscous flow. We're left in molecular flow. There's just a few blind people around at this point in time. And gases will come in any direction, will come into the ionization. Remember I was talking about the filament. We didn't want to oxidize the filaments because they become brittle and they break. All right, same as turning on your light switch. We turn on the light switch because we're under good vacuum. All right, that creates an ionization or electrons basically coming out. We actually hit the free neutrals that are going on. We ionize the gas by knocking off an electron, which gives it a positive charge. By giving it a positive charge, how many of you got kids? Raise your hands real quick. How many got kids? All right, how many of you used to play with magnets on your parents' refrigerator? All of us on that one used to say A, B, C and create letters and names. Well, a positive and a positive repel one another, all right? And that's exactly what we're doing here. We have a positive ion of a gas molecule. We put a positive voltage up above and we accelerate down. We give it a little slit right here and now I've got a beam line. I've got a beam line to the door. I can go straight to the door because I've given it direction. I've contained the ionization straight to the door. We have a magnetic field down here, all right? Right hand rule of flux. The ions come down, they can be bent in the magnetic field that's gauss at a certain rate and all that. And the only thing lighter than helium is, for those of you? Oh, okay. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. So mass four is helium, mass two is hydrogen. So hydrogen's lighter, bends too much. Mass four, we tune specifically just right to hit our target. And everything else, other than hydrogen and helium, is pretty stinking heavy. It can't quite make the bend with acceleration we give it, so it hits the corner. Also known as magnetic sector uh, spectroscopy, uh, and is specifically tuned for the helium molecule, and that's why we call it a helium leak detector. So here's kind of another visual of it. You've got your ionization source, you bend down. If everything's just right, we hit our target, we get a current, goes to a preamplifier. So in, I'm going to say eight years ago, out of ASU, Arizona State University, we had a bunch of physicists as well as out of MIT, 
help us redesign the construction of our 90 degree bend lead detector. So this is a 90 degree bend. This is just straight up 90 degrees and all this. You can kind of get the feel for that. You can see it there. But here, if you look at 90 degrees, helium being right there, we had resolution that was pretty rock solid down to e to the minus nine flow rates, all right? We'll talk about flow rates in a little bit if you don't understand, and that's okay. And we can see all the crossover of the different gases. They came up using defector fields, uh, computer software, and all that stuff, that at 135 degrees, we can really depict helium specifically at that particular geometry. And we were able to get 100 times better sensitivity just by changing the dynamics of the magnetic field and the uh, geometry of the leak detector or the heart itself. It's like having open heart surgery, right? And they came up with a new development, and now my heart's working that much better. And you know, I kind of joke about that, but I've had heart issues, and I've had them go up my leg, I've had them cauterize different veins, and I swear I feel much better than I did even when I was a young man. All right, so. I kind of get that from the heart perspective. Then when we talk about a leak, well, what's a leak? Oh, Clark, man, I don't know what a leak is. How do I calibrate my leak detector? Well, basically, this is a glass ring, and basically we charge the whole outside with helium, and helium being such a small molecule will permeate the grain structure of glass. Oh, look at that. It goes through the glass. It goes through the glass at a certain rate, at a certain temperature. If I'm in Malaysia working, it's hotter than crap. My grain structure is all open. I'm sweating like a pig. If I'm on the Alaskan pipeline in the middle of the winter and teaching leak detection, it's cold. Everybody's like, you know, goosebumps going on. I'm not leaking as much. Same is true with your helium leak going through glass right here. In a hotter environment, you're going to permeate more. More gas is going to come through it. In a colder environment, not as much. That's where we actually came up with the newer leak detector side. Instead of going through a glass cylinder now, now we go through a shaving cream container for the most part. Looks like a shaving cream container. And we're permeating through a ceramic membrane now versus a glass membrane. And we have temperature compensation built in. So for those of you who are doing military, FDA, ISO, uh, specific quantifiable leak checking to an, to an absolute no pass fail leak rate, this is critical, because every degree C changes your leak rate by 3%. So go back in the days, I used to walk into customer sites and they would have a leak, leak rate chart, and this is my failure point at this particular temperature in the room, and this is the temperature in the room, and now you don't have to do it. It basically tells you what it is, changes the algorithm in the leak detector, and you come up with the correct, uh, appropriate leak rate for a given uh, scenario. So this is what the container kind of looks like, and you go, oh, fart, you know, what if I run out of helium in this container? It's not run out of helium. It, the depletion rate is 2% per year, and even dealing with the E to the minus 8 range leak, that thing's not going to be depleted until 57 years. And quite honestly, I've got leaks in my lab that are 20 or 30 years old that are still pretty close to active. I'm not active, active maybe 5 or 6 meter divisions off. But for those of you in industry, just for finding a leak, more than accurate. For those of you who are doing mil spec, FDA, and all that stuff, well, that's way out of spec, and you guys need to update your qualifications and all that. And this is a pretty cheap component for the most part. So the state ISO, military, FDA, and all that stuff, it's a $300 component once a year. You change it out, put in the new specifications in your leak detector, hit the calibrate button, done deal, and the system will run through this leak detection. Wait, hold on a second here. Everything leaks. Is there any? I could take a perfectly stainless steel three-inch component and weld it up 100%, and guess what? It leaks. But at what rate does it leak, Bart? Very small. <laughs> all right, but the reality is the grain structure and the makeup of all material, you know, we're, we're down to hydrogen, the smallest atom there is, right, can permeate through the grain structure of everything to the opposite side. So everything leaks. So the question that really comes up in engineering and all that, and those of you who are designing your specifications, is what's acceptable of a leak? What's going to contaminate my process? What type of warranty do I need to maintain? What type of quality do I need to ensure that I'm giving my customers a non-leaky conformance or setup? And that's where really the specifications come in on the engineering side. And yes, we have a leak detector that can go down to the minus 12 in leak rate. Well. Do you really need to go there? Because we can, 
you know, I, I've seen it where the spec is minus nine, and oh, you can do minus 12, oh, we're, we're gonna lower the rate, well, why? There's so much more cost involved with the lower and lower, you, you don't wanna create vacuum or leak check to. The costs start to go up exponentially uh, in opposite to that. So leak rates can be measured in standard CCs, Pascal, Tor liters, ounces of Freon, bubbles per second, ounces of, there are so, several different conversions that can go on depending on what industry you're in, whether it's automotive, whether it is high energy physics, whether you're dealing with China, Europe, or America as far as what the standard flow rate is. But basically, a flow rate is how much gas can get through a given hole in a given period of time, all right? And we sit there and go, all right, Mr. Bart, how big is a leak? Well, one cubic centimeter. Let's take a cubic centimeter. That's about a cubic centimeter, somewhere in there, maybe a little bit less, a little bit more. Three dimes worth of volume. How much is it going to take for me to take that much gas and flow it from one side to the other side with one, uh, with one standard, which means one atmosphere, one atmospheric differential, all right? How much time is it going to take me to get that much gas to the opposite side? Well, I got an answer for you. Of course I do. Or maybe I don't. Three, two, one. Well, I thought I did. Just hit enter there instead. I don't know what's going on on that side. All right, easy walk. No. All right. <coughs> um, so, one standard cubic centimeter of gas, like we just talked about, at zero degrees Celsius. If I have a pacemaker put into my heart, like I was talking about earlier, I've got issues going on. If I'm gonna have somebody install a pacemaker, well, is E to the minus eight gonna cut it? Oh, it's only gonna last for 3.2 years before it leaks. What? No way, I don't wanna have it redone again. Maybe 32 years, but if I'm a young guy like I am, I'm gonna tell you I am anyway. Uh, 32 years, well, maybe that's not long enough. But sure enough, I'm not gonna last the 320 years of life, right? So. Minus 10 is probably out of the question. I mean, we can put some safety margin in there, but it's a little low. Minus eight might be a bit high. So you as an engineer have to figure out what's appropriate and what's acceptable for your particular application. Now this is based on 100% helium. A few engineers in the room are going, well, our blood and leaking through into a pacemaker is not quite 100% helium. That has more to do with the molecules and molecule size. And yes, you're all correct. I can take you to whatever level you'd like to go in the conversation. Reality is for pacemaker, you're probably in the seven, eight range because the reality is the blood molecule to come or leak into a component to actually contaminate a component is gonna be much greater than, uh, or much larger size than a singular molecule of helium. So all that takes into account what's going on. This is still not working. All right. Most leaks in the industry are found so if you're dealing with uh, processing industrial applications, like you guys are doing gas filling or anything like that, most orifice leaks, meaning I've got a pinhole in a well, I've got a leaky gasket, I've got a leaky valve, some sort of seat is not seated 100% correctly, is going to be found between a major leak to a minus nine range leak and in this territory. When I start getting below minus nine range, I'm dealing with very, very small molecular leaks, and that's kind of a different application than an industrial leak, in which we're trying to find incredibly small uh, processes that are going on. Why do we use helium? Well, it's inert. It doesn't react with anything. It's pretty easily found. And guess what? As we breathe right now, there's only five parts per million in the room. So it's a very small background. So I can spray helium and change the background environment to be able to do some leak detection, but it's not gonna overly impact the negligible helium that's in the area. I can change that though. So let's see here, testing methods. All right, so now we're gonna actually get in. We've talked about the leak detector. We talked about the heart. Where in the world is a leak detector used and why Bart? Well, it's to prevent material loss, contamination, reliability, and liability. Uh, we always want to test in the direction of test. How am I doing time-wise? Beautiful. All right, so I've got about 10 more minutes left. We might be able to blow through this. Uh, we've we got a couple of different things we can do. If I have a component, we can either do a measure, pass, fail. Is my part good or bad? We can do differential pressures to be applied. When we talk about that huge space chamber, I had to pump on both sides of it. That's a differential pumping. 
my cycle and response time, because when you're in industry, guess what? Time is money. When you're in academia or you're up at the labs or you're running experiments, well, you know what? I've got a couple of days to get down to the pressure or whatever it is. I've got a little bit more leeway. So these are questions. I used to work as a metallurgist and a, and a rod burner through college. So I, I was burning rod and welding. There's nothing worse than my product getting out to the field, being shipped back to my boss. My boss would come down and go, ah, you screwed up. You cost us this much product, this much time. You know how great it would be if I had a proof statement out of the back of my leak detector that said, no, I did what I said I did, and I leak checked it, and I validated it, and something either happened in shipping or in their application. It wasn't me. Uh, cost of ownership, you know, what's that cost going to be to actually own the product? Uh, you always test under real life conditions. Why would I pull vacuum on a brake line of an uh, aircraft? If I pull vacuum on a brake line, I'm kind of squeezing things down, spraying helium on the outside. Brake line needs to be pressurized and charged to 2,000 PSI, and then sniff the helium that's coming out of it. SpaceX gives me a call, come in, do a bunch of training. Hey, Bart, we've got these problems with these oxygen valves, we don't know what's going on. They're pulling vacuum on these positive pressure valves that are going on for their oxygen you know, delivery system, which are all under positive pressure. I mean, well, first of all, you guys are pulling vacuum on it. You're doing it wrong. We need to rechange everything. Three days after my training, next, you know, it's about two, three years ago, SpaceX rocket grounded for helium leaks. Oh, maybe they were doing something incorrect. I mean, guarantee you, they weren't leaking helium. It just sounded benign by them saying helium. That was a marketing strategy. But the reality is that's why it's important to educate and understand. Positive pressure for your pipelines. You want to put a positive pressure in your pipelines to see where it's coming out versus creating a vacuum because you can seal up other small leaks when they're creating a vacuum under uh, certain scenarios. All right, so we always want to check under the given scenario. So we can create a vacuum, basically meaning I'm pumping through the leak detector and I can spray helium to the outside. And helium being such a small molecule will permeate grain structure, like we're talking about with the glass. If I have a sealed component, like I did the uh, pacemaker, I put the pacemaker inside here that was sealed. Spray helium. Oh, look what's going on in this one. Spray helium around the outside, and if nothing comes to the inside, part's good. Somebody was talking about a high, uh, high vacuum chamber or a process chamber. Was that you? A big vacuum system. You could have a vacuum system out here, and you connect the leak detector to it. So if you did maintenance on it, change the O-rings change the pump, change the process on the inside, the valves on the doors or anything else that's going on. This is the type of scenario you do. And there might be several, there's several applications to each of these that are show, being shown right now that I can get more specifics with. If I had a component I want a total quantifiable leak, I might have a small leak here, small leak here, small leak here. But when I spray helium on the outside and goes through the leak detector, I'm getting a total leak rate for this. It's not telling me where the leak is but I know if it's pass or fail. Then I take it out, I give it to the engineers or the technicians who go, oh, well, yeah, it's kind of leaking here in these different spots, and they deal with refining the process. Into the theory of it all, I got my test product on here. Remember, there's five parts per million of helium in atmosphere. If I spray helium right here, I change that concentration to tens of thousands of parts per million. If there's a micro leak, that helium penetrates the inside get sucked down through the leak detector, and we're able to quantify or ionize through those hot filaments and bend all those molecules and hit the target and give me a known leak rate as far as how big that leak rate is. The other major application is uh, gas panel groups, and different people have to charge a system where we don't want to pull back in, we want to do a little bit more charging or percentage of charge into a system. We charge the pipeline, the component, the brake line, or whatever it is, with a certain amount of healing. And then that certain amount of healing, remember, there's only five parts per million around outside. If I have a straw, like we're at McDonald's, drinking out of a milkshake or whatever it is, we're sucking air in from the outside. That's five parts per million. Well, I can kind of figure out five parts per million at whatever flow is even minus seven, but all of a sudden, if I pressurize, all of a sudden that helium concentration around here is going to increase significantly. So I take this little straw, basically, connected to the leak detector, and we go around all the different edges, and I get to here, ding, 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 this starts going on, letting me know that, you know, it's leaking out in that one particular zone, or that one particular area. Again, 
20, 30 different applications and dynamics with each of these. So if you run into any of those, again, I, I'm the application guy who supports about 15 sales guys on the entire Western Hemisphere. Feel free to give me a call. We'll work it out and we'll get through it. That sniffer probe or that straw assignment that we were kind of going around, well, there's only a certain speed you can go. You, know, you go too fast, you can go right through it. I was at Bremerton <coughs> Subbase, nuclear, nuclear Trident missiles, inter, interballistic missiles being rebuilt, and they're sniffing the inside of the, the, the rocket jet on the backside using a sniffer probe, and they had a, a, a pro and a con or a positive pass fail situation. Well, guess what? Sniffer probe, you can't get a quantifiable number. And they gave all these military guys a quantifiable number to leak it, and they didn't understand how it worked. Next one, we had to call in all the engineers, and, and, and I basically created a big fiasco to uh, make sure that they were leak checking our uh, nuclear arsenal correctly. You know, there's a lot of people who don't fully understand all the dynamics around that. And if they're not up to speed, and you need vacuum, you need leak detection, give Adger on the call. We'd love to come alongside you guys and help you out, all right? Uh, sometimes in a leak detector, there's this little leak detector right here. Whether it's the small one or the big one, maybe it doesn't have a pump or a boom for the most part to, to pull you down to a low enough vacuum to even leak check. That's where a secondary pump comes involved, where I might have a larger pump versus the smaller pump. And basically, that's helium coming in, a lot of helium going to the big pump, a little bit of helium going to this one, a flow separation. And we're almost through this, you guys. I'm going to blow through this. This one right here basically says, if you want to save money in helium, or I don't want to contaminate my environment, we can do calculations where if I have a e to the minus 6 leak rate with 100% helium, that same e to the minus 6 rate with 10% helium versus the 100 is now a e to the minus 7. But let's say I even want to save more helium. It was a minus 6, but I only want to use 1%. We drop another decade. Now my leak rate is 1 to the minus 8. So 1 to the minus 6 leak rate is the same as 1 to the minus 8 with 1% versus 100% just by changing the zeros. It's just a mathematical game. But it helps you from contaminating your environment, what's going on in your environment, as well as your cost of healing and healing usage. Let me go to the next couple here. One, so this one right here talks about healing and coming through. It goes straight up to the mechanical pump, whether it was dry or wet. Healing being such a small molecule goes backwards through that turbo pump. Where this is that turbo pump that's taking a blind man this way taking a blind man this way. Helium so small goes back in, gets ionized. We magnetically bend it, accelerate it, count it right there. That's how the leak detector basically works. Bam. Uh, again, it kind of goes through, shows you your Q rate or your gas flow going through, gets pumped up to the exhaust. Helium so small goes back through. This is a large system. I won't spend any time on it. I won't spend any time on that. That would have, that would have been fun. Zero factor I will talk about real quick. It is an option. If I pump down this particular room from vacuum, there's residual helium, whether it was stuck on the wall or in the air, that's going to cause an upscale rate. We have something my, my kid likes to bake. All right? How many of you ever cook something and bake something? Nobody? <laughs> Donuts? Cake? You know, my kid takes the bowl. He puts it on the scale. All right? That doesn't, the bowl doesn't count as baking soda, does it? No. What's he do? He tears out the scale or presses zero. All right, so now, guess what? The bowl weighs nothing. Same thing with the leak detector and the signal. As I'm pumping down, we're waiting for it to get down to minus 10, minus 11, so I can leak check at the level I need. We can either wait for a long period of time, wait for it to get way out to where I need it to be, or I can tear it out or zero it. If I zero it, it drops my signal immediately, just like it does here. And my son adds one atom more of baking soda, helium in this case. We add one helium molecule more, and bam, I get a leak rate reading. It's going to go up, and I'm going to be able to see it. And you can see the curve right here that even though I zeroed it, the natural pump down is still going down, just like if it was added up here, it would be like this. We just tear it down. This is under scale. Every 50 milliseconds, this thing always keeps you on scale. So even though we tear it out, we're not losing any, any leaks down underneath the table. 
you know, there's no magic going on down below the table. We're always keeping it on scale. We're always able to see every leak that goes on. Some applications, that's good. There are other applications where you don't use that at all. For the most part, you guys, we've got a couple things that hold out suppression for background. We're not going to get into it. And I think we're done. That way you guys can make your uh, raffle tickets and all that stuff. I hope everybody wins. If you do have questions about helium, helium leak detection, systems, system design, uh, maintenance, or any of that stuff, give Agile a call. We'll work with you. Come by our booth. We'll give you business cards. You want leak detection brochures or 1-800 numbers. It's all on there. Hopefully I didn't bore too many people. <laughs> What's up, bud? No. Okay. Yes. <laughs> sure. Okay, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.